This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Watch over 2,400 documentaries for free for 31 days at curiositystream.com forward slash real engineering. On March 27th, 2019, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced to the world that India had conducted its first successful anti-satellite test, launching a three-stage missile from Abdul Kalam Island on the northeastern coast of India, with a trajectory taking it over the Bay of Bengal. A trajectory that would eventually lead it to intercepting India's military satellite, Microsat-R, 283 kilometers overhead. The 740 kilogram satellite met its end when the kinetic kill vehicle plowed through it, shattering it into hundreds of pieces which proceeded to spread in Earth's orbit. The test was universally condemned, a completely unnecessary political posturing move that added significantly to Earth's growing space debris problem. This isn't some far off distant problem that we need to worry about, and the probability of collisions occurring is not only continually rising, but there have already been several collision events that have damaged the International Space Station and other high value satellites. We can't blame the current state of affairs entirely on anti-satellite tests like this. Every single time we launch into space, we generate some sort of unwanted waste. Solid fuel rockets deposit aluminium oxide particles, explosive bolts fragment into pieces, even chips of paint can cause issues. In 1983, the Challenger Space Shuttle was struck by a 0.2 mm chip of paint that managed to gouge this pit out of one of its windows. In fact, in the first 67 Space Shuttle launches, 177 impacts were found in the windows, 45 of which were large enough to warrant a replacement window. Post-mission analysis determined that all of these impacts were caused by space debris, with 44% being caused by aluminium alloys, 37% by paint chips, 12% by steel, 5% by copper, and 2% by titanium. At $50,000 a pop, this did not come cheap. Based on these numbers, the space shuttle had a 67% chance of impact causing significant damage to the windows during their 10-day missions, and these probabilities have only risen over time. In 2007, the likelihood of a collision between any satellite in low Earth orbit and a piece of debris over 1 cm in size was 17-20% to 20 in a single year. That statistic increased to 25% to 33% later that year when China tested their own anti-satellite missile. By 2010, the chance of a 1 cm piece of debris striking a satellite had increased to 50% a year after two full-size satellites, Iridium-33, a US communication satellite, and Cosmos-2251, a retired Russian communication satellite, collided at 42,000 km per hour, obliterating both satellites and producing over 1,000 fragments over 10 cm in size and many more too small to be tracked. So, the chances of collision are not small by any measure. They are common, and it's only a matter of time before another serious incident like this 2009 collision occurs again. So, it is prudent that we design satellites to be capable of not only withstanding small impacts, but capable of dodging larger ones. The ISS, for example, is designed to withstand objects up to 1 cm in size, and can dodge larger, trackable objects 10 cm wide. The biggest danger to the occupants of the ISS are objects in between these sizes that are untrackable but large enough to cause serious damage to the International Space Station. When the ISS was being planned, NASA laid out a basic risk management policy that the probability of any critical component of the ISS being penetrated by space debris would be less than 19% over 10 years. A critical component is characterized by anything that could potentially lead to loss of life if it was damaged, and designers are careful to correctly categorize each component on the ISS to ensure this is the case, which often involves performing hypervelocity impact tests here on Earth. This resulted in things like batteries and ammonia accumulators being characterized as non-critical when they didn't explode during tests, and so received less shielding than other critical components. Space debris is just a fact of everyday life on the ISS that astronauts need to be aware of. To get a better sense of what it's like living with this, I spoke with former ISS commander Chris Hadfield on the phone. When you're on board a spaceship, you have a constant undercurrent awareness of the, uh, the ever-present risk of uh, something hitting your spaceship and causing a leak. 
It's sort of like when you're driving a car, you always know that at some point you, you could have some sort of accident. You know, it's just, it, it's not heavy in your mind. You know what happens. You know, the odds are that eventually it will happen for sure. And you just have to find a way to live with it. And, and so the way we live with it is to understand the risk as accurately as we can. We, we know the statistics. We know the relative risk of man-made debris versus uh, naturally occurring debris. And we know how the space station is designed to uh, resist it with the, uh, with the multi-layer shielding. And, and then we also have procedures. So let's talk about that shielding first. Shielding the ISS with heavy plates, as tanks do here on Earth, is not an option. This is the damage a 13mm spherical bullet will do to a 13cm aluminium plate when travelling at 7km per second. It prevented penetration and only just managed to prevent a large chunk of spall to break off from the interior surface. At 13 centimeters, a 1 meter squared aluminium plate like this would weigh about 338 kilograms. When the ISS started construction in 1998, the per kilo cost to launch to the International Space Station's orbit using the Space Shuttle was about $93,400. Placing a 1 meter squared shield like this at a cost of $31.5 million. This is an extremely inefficient use of material, and the ISS uses something much more elegant called a Whipple shield. The Whipple shield uses the debris's own velocity to stop it. At 4 km per second and higher, the energies involved are so immense that the projectile itself breaks apart and vaporizes on impact. Whipple shields take advantage of this by creating a shield that is composed of several thin sheets of armor separated by space. So, when a meteoroid or debris does strike it, it first breaks up into thousands of smaller superheated fragments, thereby spreading the energy of the impact over a larger area for the following shield layer. The European Space Agency conducted tests of their Kevlar Whipple shields, which protect their ATV vehicle. They did this by shooting a 7.5mm diameter aluminium bullet at 7km per second, which tore straight through the Kevlar shield, but only left a scorch mark on the 3mm aluminium wall behind it. These kind of impacts occur fairly frequently, and as Chris Hadfield told me during the call, If you just sit quietly by the wall of the space station and wait a while, you can hear things hit your ship. And that's kind of an interesting thing. It doesn't happen too often, and sometimes all you're hearing is the vehicle cooling and heating in the sun, so you're hearing the natural popping of metal expanding or contracting. But occasionally you hear just like the sound of a small bullet or high-speed stone uh, banging into the thin aluminum hull of your ship. So, astronauts are occasionally reminded of the space debris problem, and have to be careful not to cut their suits while on spacewalks on sharp impact edges. While this is a highly effective form of shielding that minimizes the weight of shielding needed, it is only effective for smaller debris. Larger particles would tear right through the shield, and for those circumstances, the ISS and other satellites literally have to dodge the incoming shrapnel. Ground-based radar, like the Haystack radar, are the main source of spatial data we have on space debris. It is an X-band radar system that simply stares at selected points in space and waits for debris to pass through its radar beam. This gives us size, speed, and direction information, which is fed into a database that allows NASA and other space agencies around the world to predict potential collisions. When a collision is predicted, maneuvers can be planned to allow the International Space Station to dodge it. But these maneuvers come with a cost, and Mission Control needs to assess if the risk is worth that cost. They start by drawing an imaginary box around the International Space Station, 50 km squared and 0.75 km deep. This acts as an exclusion zone, and any tracked debris that passes through it will send an alert to Mission Control. From there, careful risk analysis begins. If there is a 1 in 10,000 to a 1 in 100,000 chance of collision, the ISS receives a yellow warning which means flight controllers must perform avoidance maneuvers if they do not interfere with mission objectives. This can be as simple as interfering with microgravity experiments to forcing the Soyuz to miss a launch window. If there is a greater than 1 in 10,000 risk, then a red warning is received, and the International Space Station must take action. Control momentum gyros can be used to alter the station's orientation. 
while thrusters on the FESDA module or on docked vehicles can be used to provide the necessary acceleration. Boosting to a higher orbit requires expensive propellant, but the ISS already needs to perform reboosts every few months to maintain its orbit, so these dodging maneuvers will just alter the scheduling of these already needed boost burns. These exclusion zones exist for all satellites in NASA's database, and on March 29, 2012, Julie McEnery, the project scientist for the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, received an automated email alert, informing her of a predicted incursion between Fermi and Cosmos 1805, a retired Russian spy satellite, where the two would pass within 700 feet of each other. The decision on what to do with this information was left to her, and the lessons learned from the previous satellite collision were not lost on her. In order to ensure they did not collide, Fermi would need to rotate away from its view of the sky to point its thrusters in the direction of travel. It would then perform a one second burn that would separate the two satellites crossing temporarily. These thrusters had not been tested before, as they were designed to take the satellite out of orbit at the end of its life. And so, there was significant anxiety within the team that they could malfunction and end Fermi's mission prematurely. Thankfully, that did not happen, and Fermi continues to give us valuable information about the universe to this day. These issues are only going to grow as human activities in space grows, and it's time we began thinking more seriously about how we manage our cosmic neighborhood. Mainstream media tends to be incredibly alarmist about this issue. So all of that's, that's debris that you're looking at there. Ugh. So anyway, yeah, so your concern for debris is well placed. And we may, we may be putting so much debris in space that we will close ourselves off from space travel because of the dangers it would take to get through our own garbage heap. Space debris obviously does not look like this. The vast majority of it is too small to see. Occasionally, we have massive debris, like the upper stage of Apollo 12's Saturn V rocket, which is still in orbit and expected to return to Earth in the next couple of decades, but this material is easy to dodge. After all, space is a big place. We are not going to be trapped on the planet, we are not going to lose all technology related to satellites. Even now, just a few weeks after India's anti-satellite test, a decent amount of the debris will have drifted back to Earth. We can take Operation Burnt Frost, the US's own anti-satellite test in 2008, as proof of this. There were multiple similarities between this and India's own test, with similar orbits and altitudes. Data from the Combined Space Operations Center shows that the majority of the debris from this test had fallen back to Earth within two months, while other pieces that managed to be ejected into higher orbits eventually returned to Earth about two years later. This was just the larger trackable debris. Smaller debris decays faster as it has a larger area to mass ratio, making them more sensitive to atmospheric drag. Even in orbit, molecules do exist that collide with satellites and debris, causing them to slow down and lose altitude. This isn't a reason to ignore the problem. If the problem continues to grow as our space activities grow, the potential loss in money from damaging collisions and the potential chain reaction this would cause in a busy Earth orbit is going to motivate efforts to fix the problem. It's not just the cost of the satellite that will motivate efforts. Entire economies have been built upon the services they provide. International treaties dictating space operations need to be updated to mitigate the issue, ensuring any satellite placed in orbit will be required to be capable of bringing itself out of orbit and be capable of dodging debris when needed. As we saw earlier with Fermi, this is a feature of some satellites, but not all. Some satellites simply become giant bullets when they retire. This cannot be allowed to continue. This alone will not be enough to ensure space debris is kept to a reasonable level, and active clearance may be needed if trends continue. Launching more objects into orbit to solve the problem seems to me to be a very expensive and ineffective way to deal with the problem. Someone will have to fund it, which will be difficult as most companies want to add things to space, not remove them. Not only that, but it will also add to the space debris problem with the natural byproducts of launches, while only being capable of taking down larger objects. A more promising technology that will involve using high power lasers that will be powerful enough to ablate material from the object which will provide thrust to slow its orbit and thus increase its rate of decay. There are issues with a technology like this, as it could be used as an anti-satellite weapon which would not sit well with other spacefaring nations. To overcome that it would need to be a joint venture between all spacefaring nations. Just as the ISS became an international effort to unite mankind, 
cleaning up our cosmic neighbourhood can become a uniting problem. International cooperation and rivalries have long been the driving force for advancement in the field of aerospace. World War I and II advanced aviation at an unprecedented rate, and its conclusion led to an international race to the moon. If you want to learn more about this troubled birth of aerospace, I highly recommend watching this documentary titled Pioneers in Aviation on Curiosity Stream. It will take you from the early years of the Wright brothers to the foundation of the Boeing and Douglas aircraft companies, through the difficult years of the Great Depression, and the rapid advancement during the World Wars, culminating in the space race. You can watch all three hours of this three-part series for free by signing up to CuriosityStream using the code REALENGINEERING or using the link in the description. This will give you a month of complimentary free access to over 2,400 documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers. After that first free month, you can continue your access for just $2.99 a month. As usual, thanks for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Instagram, Twitter, Discord server and subreddit are below.